Hello, I'm Evan Lee, and welcome to the latest in our interview series, Legally Speaking, uh, co-sponsored by uh, the University of California Hastings and the California Lawyer Magazine, where we have conversations with the most interesting lawyers in the world. Now, there aren't many lawyers who have had more interesting careers than our guest today. He's famous for three vastly different things. First of all, he is one of the nation's foremost experts in constitutional law. Second, he is one of the nation's foremost appellate advocates. And third, he is the founding dean of the University of California, Irvine School of Law. And we are currently sitting in his beautiful office. Erwin Shemarinsky, welcome to Legally Speaking. Thank you, and thank you for the really kind introduction. We are taping this on uh, October 8, 2010, and your newest book has just come out, and it is sitting on the table. That's what it looks like in the bookstores. Now I'm going to tell the read. Uh, I'm going to tell the audience right now that I'm going to be referring to this, which is uh, a set of uncorrected proofs. This is not what the book looks like in the stores. Um, the book is called *The Conservative Assault on the Constitution*, published by Simon and Schuster, and according to Amazon, it's selling like hotcakes. Now, the title of the book makes no bones about it. You're calling out the right in this country insofar as they've changed constitutional law uh, since uh, Richard Nixon became president. And yet we are told that this is the year of conservative anger. The Republicans are going to take back the House, uh, the Tea Party, the birthers. Um, Democrats running away from the president. This book shouldn't be selling well. Why is it? Ever since Richard Nixon ran for president in 1968, conservatives have sought to dramatically change constitutional law. The thesis of this book is that in almost every area they succeeded. We tend not to realize it because the cases come down one at a time. Not every case is in a conservative direction. Some of the targets of conservatives, Roe versus Wade, the school prayer decisions, haven't been overruled. But what I wanted to say, and say to a wider audience than we mm -hmm. as law professors mm -hmm. usually just speak to, is that the conservatives have succeeded, to a very large extent, in remaking constitutional law. One of the things uh, that you're famous for is writing scholarly books, especially treatises. Uh, you know, books that summarize constitutional law. Now, anybody who knows you personally, um, or who's followed your career as an advocate, knows that you're pretty much an ACLU left liberal, but your treatises don't read that way. And so, I mean, if you would cover up the name of the author on your constitutional law treatise, so the one that I'm most familiar with, which is Federal Courts, you really can't tell what the political ideology of the author is. This book, on the other hand, reads in some ways like a political manifesto. Um, it's a call for the nation to take back the court and to take back the Constitution from what you por portray as almost like a conservative coup d'etat of the sort. Uh, so, I'm curious, when did you decide to break from this long-standing pattern of authorship? I mean, how did that come about? As you know so well, we speak and we write in different settings. And the voice we use is very much a function of the setting. When I'm teaching class, I'm trying as hard as I can to be neutral and fair, and I want both sides to come out. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching 31 years. I've never had a student evaluation that accused me of being liberal in class because that's not my role. My role in class is to make sure that all the arguments come out. When I write a case book or a treatise, my role is to try to be as fair as I can. I'm sure there are places where my biases come through, but I try very hard that conservative professors as well as low professors would want to use my case books mm -hmm. and recommend my treatises. On the other hand, when I write op-ed pieces, they're my expressing my opinion. Law review articles occasionally are trying to be more neutral, but I would say the vast majority of law review articles that I've written are advocating a viewpoint that okay. undoubtedly mine is a liberal viewpoint. Um, I wrote a university press book a few years ago about federalism, mm 
And it was, there's no doubt where my politics were throughout the book. But I decided a few years ago that I wanted to write to more than just other law professors, and even more than the lawyers, that I do believe that conservatives have succeeded in changing so much of constitutional law, and that people don't realize it. And so the purpose of this book was to put that forward. So this is very clear. This is a trade book. I mean, it's this a trade is book. very clearly a trade book. It's it's a, unlike your previous writings, which have been aimed at the law professoriat, or law students, or judges, or law, the practicing bar, this is written for everybody. It's written for all American citizens. That's right. The goal of this book from the beginning was that it would be a trade book and hopefully accessible to a wide audience. Certainly, I hope that lawyers and judges and law students will buy it and read it, but I also hope that the general public will buy it and read it. And so I went to a trade press. I mean, Simon mm -hmm. Schuster is a trade press. No question. And as I wrote it, I wrote it in a style that I hope would be accessible to non-lawyers. Um, my editor, a very experienced editor at Simon Schuster, Robert Bender, um, isn't a lawyer, and it was wonderful to have his eyes on the book. Um, there was one phrase that he saw that he said, only lawyers now, and it took me by surprise, bright line rule. I would have never thought of bright line rule. He took that out. Yeah, and he said, well, where did he put it in his play? Oh, he said to me, put in something else. I'll put but it in, okay, an example yeah. of right. the one place where right. he said, I was using a phrase that only lawyers would know, and it's not the one that I would have guessed. Um, I wouldn't have guessed that either. But it is written more in the style of an op-ed piece. It is. It's written for a general audience. Now, of course, the difference between an op-ed piece is you get 750 words, and... Right, 10, that, words. Well, right, that's right, that's right. So the book is arranged uh, thematically. Um, for example, you have a chapter on the resegregation of public schools. Uh, the, da the dangerous concentration of power in uh, a unitary presidency, uh, the dismantling of the wall between church and state, crackdown on the rights of the criminally accused, erosion of individual liberties, um, and then you have a chapter on the procedural rules uh, that keep people out of court entirely in, in civil cases. But you have a very poignant and uh, at least original to me, a uh, literary device uh, for introducing each one of these chapters. And that is by telling the story of an individual client that you unsuccessfully represented in court. How did that literary device occur to you? I knew that to write a trade press, I need to make this less abstract. People need to relate to this on a personal, on a human level. Actually, the first thought that I had was to take a couple of characters like Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and make them the unifying device of the book to show how things that started in the Nixon administration then carried forward over time. I realized that the, the, the seeds of the vast right wing conspiracy. Well, I'm not going to say this was a vast right-wing conspiracy. I am going to say that people like Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney began in the Nixon administration, were key figures in the Reagan and Bush administrations, and then finally in the most recent Bush administration. Sure. And as to something like presidential power, I think you can trace back what the most recent Bush administration did to the policies that they were articulating during the Nixon and then the Reagan years. But as I started to construct the book that way, it didn't work. It didn't work in terms of they weren't part of all of what I wanted to talk about, and it didn't work in terms of making it human. And so I really focused on what are the stories that I can tell that mm -hmm. people can relate to, because mm -hmm. people relate to stories much more than to legal doctrines. Absolutely. And, and then it came to me that the stories I could tell were the stories of the cases that I was involved in. Um, and so all of the chapters but one begin with a story like that, and the one that doesn't actually begins with the story of my dad's dad. Yes, and, and I do want to talk about that. Um, I do want to talk about that later. Um, the first client that we get introduced to is a man named Leandro Andrade, um, a man who stole $153 worth of videotapes from number of Kmart stores in Southern California. Now, unfortunately for him, this was his third strike under California's uh, 
anti-recidivism statute. And he was uh, therefore sentenced to 50 years in prison without the possibility of parole. You argued his case before the U.S. Supreme Court claiming that the sentence was grossly disproportionate to the offense. But the court voted five to four against you. Now the chapter in the book, and it's actually the introduction to the book, is called The Constitution Touches Everyone. So I guess I have two questions about that. Number one, why did you choose Andrade's case to lead off with? And number two, what do you mean by the Constitution touches everyone? I chose the Andrade case for many reasons. I mean, it's a very compelling story. It's for me, along with the two death penalty cases that I lost, the hardest things that I've lost as a lawyer. I represented Andrade for several years. I won in the Ninth Circuit and then lost in the Supreme Court. It's also a story that people can relate to. And there's something shocking about the idea that a man has never committed a violent crime is going to spend 50 years in prison. And so it seemed to me that it was both in a personal and a literary way a good way to begin the book. Um, what I mean by the Constitution touches everyone is just what the title says. But for the accident of circumstances, Leandro Andrade could be your brother or my brother. It could be one of our children. Andrade went into the military, became addicted to heroin. And whether he stole these videotapes because of his heroin addiction, certainly why he stole the other things earlier in his life. And I want everybody to see it's not an us and them, that Leandro Andrade and Jeffrey Rico and the others who I talk about in that chapter could be any of us. And the reality is that the Constitution does touch everyone, including in some of the most intimate aspects of our lives, whether couples have access to contraceptives, whether women have access to abortion, whether people get into the college of their choice, all of that is what the Constitution Touches Everyone means. Now the other reason for beginning with this is, ultimately what I want to do in the first chapter is to say, here's an outrageous result. The mm -hmm. Supreme Court, five to four, with the conservatives in the majority, upholds a life sentence with no possibility for 50 years. Now what amounts to, what, what you say, amounts to a life That's sentence, right. given his age and life That's expectancy. Right. Um, he's eligible for all in the year 2046 when he's 87 years old. Well, the question then is, how did we get to a court that would do this? That as I've spoken to so many audiences, I tell the story of Andrade. People, even those who supported the Three Strikes Law, are shocked. So the question that I pose in the introductory chapter is, how do we get to a court? And that's the what the rest of the first chapter talks about. And then the rest of the book tells what the effects of that court are all about. I, I want to read from a, a passage uh, in that chapter. And I think it's what you're alluding to. And if it's not, then please correct me. Sure but it is. Let, let, uh, you say, to understand what conservatives have accomplished, it is necessary to look beyond the Supreme Court and beyond the judiciary. The assault on the Constitution is, is a result of a concerted effort by conservatives to alter foundational constitutional principles the focus needs to be not just on the courts, but on the policies developed during the presidencies of Nixon, Ford, Reagan, Bush, and Bush. Now, on a descriptive level, I mean, th this book has many different mm -hmm. facets to it. It clearly has a normative or a prescriptive facet to it, an advocacy facet to it. Uh, but it also has sort of a historiographical sort of explanation of how things came to be. Um, and on that level, that's kind of the thesis of the book, isn't it? What I, what, I, what I just read, that the conservative Supreme Court victories in all the areas that you touch on, race, individual liberty, rights of criminal defendants, uh, church and state, that they're not just the product of some random set of appointments to the Supreme Court or the lower federal courts, uh, that, they're, that instead they're the product of a 40-year political movement that had 
either at its center or very near its center of uh, the center of its agenda a concerted effort to appoint federal judges who would implement conservative ideology in those fields of constitutional law. I mean, is that a correct That's exactly the thesis of the book. And I think that we as law professors have tended to want to focus on the cases in and of themselves. And I don't think we've done You mean in that. isolation? In isolation, that's right. In the legal doctrines in isolation. We, we see, see them as pinpricks. Exactly. exactly. And we may connect the pinpricks, but what I said, and you described exactly my point, is that actually there's a larger conservative ideology it's been put forth by the presidential administrations that you referred to, and the justices they've appointed are about carrying that forward. And during the Nixon years, and during the Reagan years, and more recently during the Bush years, there was a attempt to put forth a conservative approach to constitutional law. It was manifest in the policies and statements of the president. It was also manifest in the justices they appointed to the Supreme Court, and the policies that they've implemented in constitutional law and the judges they've appointed to the lower federal courts. So, so let me follow that up. I, uh, earlier, I tried to bait you with the, with the phrase vast right-wing conspiracy, which of course got Hillary Clinton into trouble at one, at one point. Um, and, and you resisted that. But why resist that? I mean, other than the fact that, that somebody else got in trouble for using it, I mean, why isn't that an apt description of your, of, of your thesis? Because of the word conspiracy. Conspiracy at least has the connotation of something illegitimate, if not illegal. I don't believe that these presidents or these justices have done anything that's illegal. I think what they've done is very undesirable. Descriptively, they've made constitutional law. Normally, I think, in a very bad way, but I'm not going to accuse anybody of well, conspiracy or doing anything underhanded. But how did this happen? Then? And so you're saying it, it's not illegitimate. It's not illegitimate what they've done. It's undesirable, but not illegitimate. Meaning, I mean, what flows from that is the right has outworked the left politically. Some of it is historical accident. From 1968 to 2009, there were two appointees to the Supreme Court by Democratic presidents. There were 12 appointees to the Supreme mm -hmm. Court by Republican presidents. Some of that is, for example, that Jimmy Carter is one of the few presidents in history to get no nominees to the Supreme Court. Obama's had two in two years. That's right. On the other hand, if the 2004 election come out differently, if yeah. John Kerry or Al Gore yeah. replaced Rehnquist and O'Connor yeah. rather than George W. Bush, constitutional law would be vastly different. Vastly and I different. wouldn't have chosen to write this book. So I think some of it is that. I think some of it is also that the Republicans have cared more about the courts than the Democrats have. That the Bush presidency, the Reagan presidency, for the lower federal courts, have much more consistently picked far the right ideologues than the Democrats have picked to the left ideologues. The why, Clinton why do you think that are much more centrist. They're more pragmatic. Well, the Clintons are just much more centrist. I mean, look at the Ninth Circuit and look at the Clinton picks to the Ninth Circuit, many of them. Um, many are indistinguishable from Republican picks, whereas mm -hmm. there's no doubt who the Republican picks are. Um, I think that's in part because the Republican base cares more about judges and judicial nominees than the Democratic base does. Do they just get it? They, they get the importance of it, the centrality of it? I mean, I've heard people say that, you know, in response to voter apathy about the president, you know, what difference is it going to make? You know, they're all the same. And I've heard people say, if for no other reason than the fact that the president of the United States gets to appoint federal judges. It may also be who Clinton and Obama are, and their views about the relative role of the courts compared to other things. I think neither Clinton nor Obama has been willing to invest as much political capital in judicial picks as the Republican presidents were. And so I think this is a descriptive matter. You can look at the Ninth Circuit and look at people like, I'll name names, Johnny Rawlinson, Barry Silverman, Dick Tallman. Susan Graber, Dick Tallman, uh, Ronald Gould. Those are not... There are no, very few Republican judges. They're not Stephen Reinhardt. That, exactly. Right. Whereas then you can look at who the Republicans put on these courts. And when you look at the Janice Rogers Browns who are put on the courts, um, it's very different. Um, so I think that contributes to the result that we see. So when a few weeks ago the Ninth Circuit 
holds six to five that the state secrets doctrine prevents victims of torture from suing, what you find is the five dissenters are all Democratic appointees, but the majority includes mostly Republicans, but some Democratic appointees as well. I think that case is an illustration of what I'm saying. So would you advise Democratic presidents to quote unquote pay more attention to the ideology of the judges that they're appointing? Is Absolutely. that what flows from it? Um, it can't be a one-way ratchet where Republicans pick from fairly far to the right of the spectrum and Democrats pick much more from the middle of the political spectrum. And that's what we've experienced. Um, I think that the Democrats need to care as much about judges as Republicans do. There is nothing that a president does with more long-term impact than who that judge, president puts onto the federal courts. So as I, it's what the economists would refer to as a collective action problem in some senses. If the Republicans are going to continue to be highly ideological about their appointments to the federal bench, then Democrats really have no choice but to do the same. And yet they haven't. And yet they haven't. And uh, you know, of course, the Obama presidency said fewer federal judges confirm than any recent president. Now, when the Republicans were having their nominees filibustered, they threatened the nuclear option, and they were able to get the Democrats to take the filibuster off the table and get through. Part of that compromise, Janice Rogers Brown, um, Priscilla Owen, um, and William Pryor from um, the 11th Circuit, three extremely conservative judges. The Republicans have been filibustering wonderful picks by President Obama, like Goodwin Liu, Ed Chen, and the Democrats aren't threatening the nuclear option. It's got to work both ways. Earlier you alluded to the one chapter that does not begin with uh, a story about one of your clients, but instead it begins uh, with the story of your father. And it's kind of a long passage, but with your permission I'd like to read it. Because this moved me a great deal when I read it. Seventeen years ago, in the spring of 1993, my father was dying of terminal lung cancer. Near the end of his life, he was in the hospital, far too weak to get out of bed or even to shave. Except when sedated, he was fully conscious and completely rational. He understood that he was in the last days of his life and that he would never get out of that hospital bed. I stood next to him as he asked a doctor to administer drugs to end his life. He cogently explained to the doctor that either he was awake and in great pain or he was drugged into unconsciousness. He told the doctor that it was his time to go, and there was no point in prolonging his life a few more days. No one in my family objected to his choice. The doctor brusquely said, I can't do that, and quickly changed the subject. My father, though, was persistent and again asked the doctor to give him enough morphine to stop his breathing and end his suffering. The doctor said that the law did not allow that and that he would not discuss it further. The doctor then abruptly left the hospital room. My father died four days after making that request. I will never understand what interest the state of Indiana, where he was hospitalized, had in keeping him alive for those few additional days. He was awake for ever shorter intervals, and while awake, he complained of great pain. The tumor had blocked blood circulation to his arm, and the arm was grotesquely swollen. The doctor had suggested amputating the arm, but my dad did not see any point in having an amputation since he was about to die. He told the doctor that at that stage it didn't matter to him whether he died of gangrene spreading from the dead tissue in his arm or from the lung cancer. I cannot approach the topic of assisted death without confronting the vivid image of my father pleading with the doctor to help end his suffering. The chapter goes on 
to uh, make a powerful argument for recognizing a constitutional right to physician-assisted death. But I couldn't help feeling that, in a larger sense, this passage also kind of exemplifies the normative thesis of the book, which is more or less that neither liberals nor conservatives can interpret the Constitution in a quote-unquote neutral fashion, that value choices have to be made, and they have to be justified openly, and that those value choices will inevitably be colored by one's life experiences. That's the thesis of the book. When the Supreme Court decides what's cruel and unusual punishment, or what's a liberty, or what's reasonable in the meaning of the Fourth Amendment, because every day courts have to decide whether a search is reasonable, or in the context of constitutional law, what's a compelling government interest? Is diversity in the classroom a compelling government interest? Mm. Or even what's a legitimate government interest? All of those are value choices. There's no litmus test for whether the police were acting reasonably. There's no set of criteria the court's ever articulated for what's a compelling government interest. There's no neutral methodology that can tell us what's liberty. It's about choices. You know, no matter what, 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 about, does, what, what, what about original intent? I mean, Let's Justice Scalia easiest. keeps arguing for original intent. But even if we believe that original intent can give us some guidance to what rights are protected, and I'll talk about that in a second, most issues that have come in constitutional law aren't about that. Take just the illustrations I mentioned. The Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. What's unreasonable? Is requiring every high school student participating in extra activity to go through drug testing reasonable or unreasonable? You're not going to find the answer to that in the text of the framers' intent. That's a choice. And of course, not just the Supreme Court justices, mm. but trial courts at every level in making the decision of what's reasonable. Or another example I mentioned, when the Supreme Court dealt with affirmative action in 2003, it had to face the question of whether or not diversity in the classroom is a compelling government interest. You can't find that in the original intent or the language of the Constitution. It's a valued choice. Um, we can go through all of the other instances where courts have to decide what's compelling, what's important, what's legitimate. All of those involve value choices. None of that is resolved in the context of the original intent. Now, where original intent comes in is the notion of we decide what rights are going to be protected in the Constitution by the framers' intent. But as I argue in the book, there's so many problems with that. Um, it makes no sense that the meaning of rights should be the same today as they were in a slave society in the late 18th century. The vast majority of issues... Well, diversity in the classroom. I mean, what diversity was right. there? Um, it it doesn't make sense. Co uh, colleges and universities, we know them now, didn't exist in 1868, let alone in 1787. But you can take any of the kinds of issues that courts have to deal with, and original intent doesn't give us an answer. I also think we're going to focus on affirmative action. One of the ironies is, if there's any place where I think I could make a strong argument based on original intent, it's that the framers of the 14th Amendment, which includes the Equal Protection Clause, mm -hmm. intended something like what we would call affirmative action today. That Congress that passed the 14th Amendment passed many things that today we would regard as affirmative action. And yet, just in, in, in affirmative action in what sense? In, in the a, sense in, of, of race, conscious, race, race conscious remedies. Exactly. And yet, this is the one place that Justices Scalia and Thomas pay no attention to original intent. They just want to follow their conservative ideology. So I don't think. To the, to the Reconstruction Congress in 1867, you think color blindness in the 14th Amendment would be a non -story. Well, they did. I mean, they adopted numerous programs like the Freedmen's Bureau mm -hmm. that were race-based. There's no indication that they interpreted equal protection as a requirement for color blindness. And yet, that's, of course, how Justice Scalia and Thomas want to interpret. So there, you see a very powerful example where if it's a conflict between dominant conservative ideology and original intent, original intent gives way. But there's so many examples where original intent can't tell us the answers. Take the Second Amendment, where I don't know how it came to be, but conservatives so favor gun rights and liberals tend to favor gun control. The Second Amendment says 
a well-regulated militia being necessary to a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Mm -hmm. Justice Scalia writes an opinion that says, well, the first half of that is just prefatory. It's the second half that's operative. And he reads the Second Amendment as if the first half wasn't there at all, as if it only said the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But it's all operative language. You can't dismiss half of an amendment by saying it's just prefatory. James Madison, as you know, drafted the Second Amendment, like he drafted all the Bill of Rights, and the initial draft had a clause that exempted from militia service those who were conscientious objectors. That would indicate that the framers' intent for the Second Amendment was about a right to bear arms for militia mm -hmm. service. Justice Scalia doesn't want to pay attention to that either. Now, I think there's strong framers' intent arguments on this, like most things, either way, but I don't think you can resolve the issue through an originalist methodology. So, you want to acknowledge that value choices have to be made. They, ha they, they, they are made by liberal judges, they are made by conservative judges, but that for anybody, and you would argue that it has tended to be conservative judges, to stand behind this facade of neutrality is to shield the public from what's actually going on in the cases. That's exactly right. All justices are making a value choice. Brown versus Board of Education and saying that separate can never be equal was making a value choice that wasn't commanded by the text of the Constitution or the framers' intent. Roe versus Wade was making a value choice. When the Supreme Court said this year that corporations have the right to spend as much as they want in independent expenses. The Citizens United case. To get candidates elected or candidates they were making a value choice. The difference between liberals and conservatives is conservatives have tried to pretend they're doing something different, that they're following a neutral methodology, whereas liberals are making it up. And one of the things that I think is important to show is that that conservative emperor has no clothes. Conservatives are doing the same thing as liberals. John Roberts went before the Senate Judiciary Committee and had the audacity to say, justices are just umpires calling balls and strikes. Any judge at any level knows the difference because every judge knows there's instances where they have tremendous discretion but as you, the law. But as you point out, Justice Sotomayor, or then Judge right. Sotomayor, said something quite similar, didn't she? And I'm equally critical. She you are. kept saying over and again that judges have to apply the law, not make the law. And she knows, like every first-year law student knows, judges all the time are making the law. So all contract law, all tort law, all property law is judge-made law. But she knew she had to say that to get confirmed. It was the easy path to confirmation, and it worked for her. Could she, she was have, able to get confirmed. Let me ask you to speculate on this. Could she have said something more honest and still have been confirmed? I don't think she needed to say that to get confirmed. I think if she would have painted a more realistic picture of judging, she might have had a harder time getting confirmed. But at that point, I forget whether there were 59 or 60 Democrats in the Senate, the reality was, as Lindsey Graham said at the first day of her confirmation hearings, unless she had a complete meltdown, she was going to get confirmed. But she chose the easiest path. I think that the well, script the safest, was written. The safest. That's right. The script was written by those who came before her, and she realized that if she uttered that script, she'd have no trouble getting confirmed and get the ultimate brass ring, a seat on the United States Supreme Court. A lay person, and many obviously, again, as indicated by uh, the sales of the book, there's a lot more than, there's not that many law professors in this country, there's not even that many law students in this country, there's obviously a lot of lay people who are buying this book, and that's a huge part of the intended audience. And, and indeed, it is the probably the principal intended audience of the book. So, a lay person reading this book would have to be forgiven if they walked away with the impression that all law is just politics by another name. That you're constantly pointing out that this rule changed to this rule, and how did it change? Well, look at who was appointed in the interim. Um, now, some of the critical legal scholars in the 1970s and the 1980s made the argument that all law is politics. But that's not your claim, is it? 
I'm troubled with the statement that all law is politics because I think we're using two words, law and politics, without defining them. There's an enormous difference between what the Supreme Court does and what Congress does. You can go lobby members of Congress. You can't go lobby members of the Supreme Court. It's acceptable for members of Congress to make a deal. I'll vote for your bill if you vote for mine. We wouldn't accept the idea that the Supreme Court justices are making a deal. Although it may have happened. It may have happened, but generally we think that each justice, every judge, is voting what he or she thinks is the best understanding of the Constitution of the law. So in that sense, there is a difference in a lot of politics. Nor do I take the radical position that there's never clear answers to constitutional or other issues. The Constitution says the president has to be 35 years old. The Constitution says there's two senators from every state. Now, those aren't the issues that get litigated before the Supreme Court. Right. When matters come before the Supreme Court, rarely is there a clear answer. That's why they're in the Supreme Court. That's right. And now we can talk about, my point is, both politics and law at the level we're talking about involve value choices. How should we interpret the Second Amendment? Should affirmative action be allowed? Should there be a right to abortion? No matter what the Supreme Court decides, it's making a value choice. And just as politicians make a value choice, so do judges. But I wouldn't want to be so reductive as to say that all law is politics and all politics is law. I think it's much more complex than that. Both, though, do involve value choices. Let me play devil's advocate for a moment and say that there are some conservative judges, including Justice Scalia, who say, that's why I'd like to get out of the business of the Supreme Court interpreting these open-ended phrases of the Constitution. I want to stick to statutory construction cases, cases where we can, you know, look at the, look at the text of the Armed Career Criminal Act and determine what Congress really has said in the rule and stick to technical stuff, lawyer stuff, not stuff that that political scientists or politicians. I mean, what's your response to that? That's not at all what Justice Scalia does. To take examples we've already mentioned, this past year he said that corporations have the First Amendment right to spend unlimited amounts of money in independent expenditures in election campaigns, striking down a federal statute. No deference to Congress, no deference to precedent. Um, the court in the last couple of years, for the first time in American history, has struck down laws regulating guns. No deference to the legislatures, no following of precedent, no, we want to get out of the business of doing this. Um, affirmative action. In 2007, the Supreme Court said that popular elected school boards could not use race as a factor in assigning students to elementary and high schools to achieve desegregation. Justice Scalia was part of that. There was no deference to the political process there. It was entirely the court, using their view, striking down what popular elected officials had done. So if Justice Scalia says, I want to get out of the business of constitutional law, you sure can't find that in opinions like these. You may not be able to answer this next question, but uh, I'm going to ask you to try for a moment to get in the heads of conservatives for a moment. Now, repeatedly in this book, you trace uh, this concerted conservative juristic movement back to the Law and Order campaign of Richard Nixon in 1968. So what do you think the goal, I mean, putting aside the problem of group intent for a moment, because we're talking about a lot of different people, but in terms of the dominant ideology, is the goal of the movement to erase the Warren Court, to, to make it so that the Warren Court, so that American constitutional law is such that the Warren, as if the Warren Court had never existed? Or does it transcend that? I mean, if, if the conser in other words, if the conservatives had their way, would they go back to 1960? Would they go back to 1950? Would they go back to 1920? Or is, in your view, the conservative juristic movement actually forward-looking in the sense that they want to remake American society in some right-wing idealistic way that has never existed before? 
Of course, the difficulty in answering the question is it assumes a homogeneity. To right, and, that, and that, that and is, so, for yeah. example, within conservatives, there are there's libertarian there's conservatives plenty. who would like to go back to the 1920s and the 1930s when the ability of Congress and states to regulate the economy was limited. I mm -hmm. think of Randy Barnett being an yes. example here. And I think there are then those conservatives who would be much more in the mold of the Scalia-Thomas type model, which have, I really think of, you can understand them best by reading the 2008 Republican platform. Now, I think that the easiest way to answer your question is by being specific. So in the area of criminal procedure, I think it's been very much to undo what the Warren Court did and expand the rights of criminal defendants, try to get rid of the exclusionary rule if they can, substantially limit Miranda, um, limit the rights of criminal defendants such as those facing death, um, the restrictions on habeas corpus and the like. Turn the clock back to about 1960. That's right. And, of course, one of the points I want to make is they've been very successful. The exclusionary rule is not gone, but it's been substantially lessened. Miranda's not gone, but it's been lessened. Habeas corpus has been substantially restricted. So this goes back to Richard Nixon's in the campaign in 1968 for overruling the Warren Court and law and order. And Ronald Reagan articulated over and again during his presidency, and I think you, this is the place where the conservatives have maybe been most successful. I think in other areas like schools, again, if you go back to Richard Nixon's campaign, very thinly veiled, if that, attacks on the desegregation orders of the Warren Court. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan proposed constitutional amendments to ban school busing, strongly opposing what the Supreme Court was doing for desegregation. You wouldn't argue that they want to go back to 1953? No, I don't think so. I don't think, in terms of having de jure segregation, mm -hmm. allowing segregation mandated by law, but what the Supreme Court has done since the 1970s is prevent both courts and popular elected school boards from achieving desegregation. So, de facto, we're ever closer to where we were in 1953. And I think that that, as I try to argue in the book, is a product of what the courts have done. Um, separation of church and state. This traces much more back to Reagan than to Nixon. Yeah. But Reagan vehemently opposed the notion of a wall that separates mm -hmm. church and state. And the Reagan appointees to the Supreme Court, Rehnquist, his chief, Scalia, Kennedy, embodied that, as did Clarence Thomas. And there may be five justices now on the court. I think there are that would reject any notion of a wall separating church and state and allow much more religion and government and government and religion. So I do think there's an overall conservative ideology, but I think to talk about it, you've got to talk about the specific areas. In 2003, in Lawrence v. Texas, the court ruled that a state may not constitutionally criminalize same-sex intercourse between consenting adults in private. Now, you agreed, of course, with the result. But you were disappointed by the reasoning. I'm going to quote. You say, the court never said that the right to engage in adult homosexual activity is a fundamental right, or that government laws regulating private adult sexual activity must meet strict scrutiny and thus be shown to be necessary to achieve the compelling government interest, end quote. Now, of course, we know uh, recently a federal district judge in San Francisco, Vaughn Walker, struck down California's Proposition 8, which limits marriage to opposite sex couples. So I'm going to ask you to uh, put on your prognosticator's hat uh, here. Now, I don't know whether you're actually involved in this litigation at, at, at this point. Um, but, uh, and, and so if you can't answer this question, um, but the question is going to be the narrowness of the reasoning that you are critical of in the Lawrence opinion, does that suggest to you that Justice Kennedy would vote to uphold Prop 8 if it were to reach the Supreme Court on its merits? I'm terrible at making predictions because I tend to predict the result that I want to see happen. Therefore, I predict that Justice Kennedy will join with, assuming they're still on the court, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan to declare Prop 8 unconstitutional. Now, a lot of qualifiers. 
it may be that the Ninth Circuit dismisses the challenge to Prop 8 on standing grounds, yes. and so the merits don't get to the yes. Supreme Court. It may be that the Ninth Circuit reverses Judge Walker, and then there's not en banc review, in which case I don't think the Supreme Court will take it. But I think if it gets to the court, my own prediction is that Justice Kennedy will join with the more liberal justices here. What makes Why you think that? Let me give you several things. There are two Supreme Court cases in history protecting rights of gays and lesbians. Roe v. Sevens in 1996, Lawrence v. Texas in 2003. Both of those majority opinions were written by Justice Kennedy. Kennedy. No justice in American history has been more attentive to or cited more foreign practices than Anthony Kennedy. This past year, when he wrote the opinion saying it's cruel and unusual punishment to impose a sentence of life without possibility of parole for a non-homicide crime committed by a juvenile, he pointed out there's no country in the world that would do this. Five years ago, when he wrote the opinion for the court, saying the death penalty for crimes committed by juveniles is cruel and unusual punishment. He pointed out there are only seven countries in the world that would allow it, none that we want to be like. In Lawrence versus Texas, he pointed to how across the world, at least in the countries we compare ourselves to, mm -hmm. the trend is not punishing private, consensual, same-sex sexual activity. I think Anthony Kennedy is one who wants to be on the right side of history. And there's no doubt where history is going on this issue. But why then not uh, say in Lawrence versus Texas that it is a fundamental right? He just didn't have the votes? Is that, is that the I actually think he, just... he did, but he didn't want to go there. Why I mean, not? The question that I immediately thought of after reading Lawrence is, why didn't he use the language of fundamental rights? Why didn't he use the language of strict scrutiny? Right. I've got to believe that Stephen Suter Ginsburg and Breyer would have been there. And his opinion doesn't. Well, in Rome River Sevens, he also just said, this law fails rational basis with you. My own sense is that he can get to the same result with regard to California's Prop 8 and say there's no legitimate government interest that's served by keeping gays and lesbians from being able to marry. In Lawrence and Romer, the court said, a state's moral disapproval of homosexual activity isn't a legitimate government interest. And I think the court will say the same thing here. But what would be lost in, in, in establishing strict scrutiny or, 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 or saying that it's a fundamental right? I mean, from, from Justice Kennedy, you know, obviously I'm asking you to speculate, I'm asking you to, 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 to get into the man's head, but I mean, what, what would be lost by that if you have the votes it for it? It would be an enormous gain for it. I just briefly sketch in the book some of the examples where because Lawrence didn't use strict scrutiny, there's some terribly undesirable results. Alabama adopted a law prohibiting the sale and distribution of sex toys. And the 11th Circuit, two to one, upholds it, saying, Lawrence is only rational basis review. Mm -hmm. There's an Ohio Supreme Court decision that involved two stepchildren, adults, being prosecuted under the incest law, um, even though they're both adults and mm -hmm. blood relatives. Mm -hmm. And the Ohio Supreme Court said, Lawrence is only rational basis review. I think here you see the dissonance of Anthony Kennedy. Anthony Kennedy is a conservative justice. He was appointed by Ronald Reagan. He votes with the conservatives more than twice as often as with the liberals in ideologically divided 5-4 cases. And yet, there is an idealistic part of Anthony Kennedy, a part that's deeply offended that the state can regulate homosexual activity. And I think the way he meshes those two parts is what you see in Lawrence and Romer. I, I had two colleagues recently arguing in a hallway. Who, who's more disappointed with Justice Kennedy, conservatives? Or liberals, they they all seem disappointed with him in, in in a lot of ways, and yet it seems like they should both be happy with him in in, in a lot of ways. Last year, there were twelve five four decisions split along ideological lines: Roberts, Scalia, Thomas Alito on one side, Stevens, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Sotomayor. Kennedy sided with the conservatives in nine out of twelve. The year before that, there were sixteen ideologically divided five four decisions. Justice Kennedy sided with the conservatives in 11, and with the liberals in 5. And that's the consistent pattern. So conservatives have a lot to be happy with, with regard to Anthony Kennedy. On but the evidently hand, they're not. On the other hand, he wrote the opinion of Lawrence. He was the fifth vote to reaffirm Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And you was, trace that in the book, and in that, I was, that was actually a change of heart on his point. Yes, we know in 1989, when he first dealt with an abortion case as a justice, he joined with... Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice White, the two dissenters mm -hmm. of in an essence calling for the overruling of Roe versus Wade. According to Linda Greenhouse's book, Becoming Mr. Justice Blackman, when the justices first met in conference in 1992, it was going to be 5-4 to overrule Roe, mm -hmm. and Justice Kennedy changed his mind. 
and none of us know, and we may never know unless he writes his memoirs, right. Why? what caused him to change his mind, but in that sense, he's a bitter disappointment to conservatives. Well, there's nothing worse than a, a betrayal, right? There's nothing worse than a traitor. Well, it, it, it's the sense that there's nothing that conservatives care about more as a symbol and perhaps as reality than Roe versus Wade being overruled. And they thought they had five votes in June 1992, and Anthony Kennedy changed his mind. You do note here uh, that one of the few new rights that the court has recognized is the right to possess firearms. And we talked about that mm -hmm. briefly uh, a few minutes ago. Um, and that was the 2008 case of the District of Columbia versus Heller, mm -hmm. which was followed up last term by uh, Mac uh, McDonald versus Chicago, uh, extending that Second Amendment right as against mm -hmm. the states. I was struck. Um, by now, of course, your memory is legendary, um, and so um, I'm not sure whether you were just kind of uh, remembering that you had written this in the book, but I was kind of struck that a few minutes ago what you said was almost exactly the same thing as what you wrote in the book, which is, and here I'm going to quote, I'm not sure when it was that views on guns came to track political ideology so closely with liberals favoring gun control and conservatives favoring gun rights. Your, your point in the book is that it's not coincidental that one of the few new constitutional rights to be recognized happens to be perfectly in line with conservative ideology. Now, as you correctly point out, liberals are outraged by Heller and uh, conservatives are overjoyed with it. But now I want you to be honest. There's almost a hint in your writing that you're not sure why liberals are outraged by Heller and conservatives are overjoyed with it. That as a matter of first, it, it's almost as if, and I mean, maybe I'm reading way too much into this, but it's almost as if as a matter of first principles, because you say, I'm not sure how it came about, right? So that, that suggests that you're thinking back to first principles. Couldn't you make a strong argument that liberals should generally be in favor of individual liberty, even at the risk of some security interests, and that Nixon law and order conservatives should be in favor of very strict gun control? What we saw from the Supreme Court in the mid-1930s is it said, we're going to make differentiations among liberties. That when it comes to property rights, we're going to give great deference to the legislature. When it comes to civil liberties and civil rights, like free speech, racial equality, we're going to give very little deference to the legislature. And so it can't be just because it's called a right, it gets treated the same. I think the Supreme Court was absolutely correct 70 years ago in creating that dual standard of review. And the question is, where would we put the Second Amendment? Mm -hmm. I don't think the fact that it's an amendment tells us the answer to that. Property is mentioned in the Bill of Rights, it's mentioned in the Fifth Amendment, mm -hmm. and yet we put it at the lower tier of review. The point I was making in the language that you quote is you're not going to find the meaning of the Second Amendment in the text. It's an enigma. You're not going to find it in the framers' intent. But you've got to find the answer by making value choices and let's then defend those value choices. Mm -hmm. I think Justice Breyer's opinion was the best in Heller because he says there are tremendous adverse consequences to guns in society. This is a place where we should allow the legislature to regulate so long as what the legislature is doing is reasonable. And I think it then puts it on that lower rung of the dual standard review that comes in the 1930s. That guns are really just a form of property and should be treated like other property in post-1937 constitutional law. So on this, you're a pragmatist. You say you, you want to look at the consequences. Well, what, what, empirically, what happens when we don't have gun control? And these are the consequences. And society can't afford to live with those consequences, or at least a legislature is entitled to make the judgment that we cannot live with those consequences and judges shouldn't upset that. And what I found interesting was two very conservative Federal Court of Appeals judges, both put on the bench by Ronald Reagan, Richard Posner on the mm -hmm. Seventh Circuit and J. Harry Wilkinson on the Fourth Circuit, wrote separate articles attacking District of Columbia versus Heller as judicial activism. Now, I don't think the label judicial activism tells us very much, mm. but I do think what it says is that here it was, 
the conservatives following their conservative ideology to come to a very activist result. Let's, let's go back to that phrase that you just used, judicial activism. Um, I don't think there's any question that that phrase has a negative connotation in the popular press and with the population generally, just as the phrase judicial restraint has a positive or angelic sort of connotation to it. But one of the points of the book is that, I mean, you cite numerous in instances where conservatives are just as willing as liberals to engage in judicial activism, if, you know, so defined, when it suits their ideology. So I guess my question is, why do conservatives continue to have a monopoly on that phrase? Because it continues to work for them politically. And then you can respond, why does it continue to work for them politically? And, and, why can't, and why can't liberals use it effectively against these conservative activist decisions? I don't know what activism means. I have this instinct that it's just the label we use for the decisions that we don't like. But if I were to come up with a definition of activism, I'd say, well, when the court is following precedent, it's restrained. When it's overruling precedent, it's being active. When the court is upholding the product of the democratic process, it's being restrained. When it's overruling, it's being active. When it decides matters narrowly, it's being restrained. When it decides matters broadly, it's being active. Now, by this sense, Brown versus Board of Education was very much judicial activism. Mm -hmm, the court mm -hmm, was mm -hmm, overruling mm -hmm. a 58-year-old precedent. The court was striking down laws that existed in every southern state. The court could have decided narrowly, just saying, mm -hmm. these schools are separate, unequal, but chose to broadly, but separate can never be equal. But I think most today, and certainly I believe, that Brown versus Board of Education is the height of exactly what constitutional law and judicial review should be about. So judicial activism can be good, or judicial activism can be bad. And this takes me back to what we were talking about earlier. That's the conversation we should be having. Now, what bothers me is that conservatives have tried to pretend that the judicial activism comes from the left during the Kagan hearings in the summer, the summer of yeah. 2010. It was the conservatives accusing her of being a judicial activist. Mm -hmm. When we lived a time now where most of the judicial activism is very much on the right. We were just talking about the well, Second Amendment. Citizens United Citizens or United. a Heller. Right. So, so I guess my question is why doesn't it stick when liberals say, well, that's an activist decision, and clearly there's overruling of pre precedent in those cases. Clearly there's a reaching out to a new frontier, if you will. Um, and leaving aside the question of whether it's warranted or unwarranted, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's clearly by the, by the technical definition of activism that you suggested by the criteria earlier. Just that's right. Those are activists. So why does, it, why does it stick when conservatives throw it, but it doesn't stick when liberals throw it? I've not thought this through, but my guess is when conservative decisions are attacked as judicial activism, conservatives aren't troubled by that because they like the results. And liberals may disagree with the results, but the phrase judicial activism doesn't have the same resonance among liberals as it does among conservatives. So liberals strongly disagreed with Citizens United, but not in terms of this activism restraint, but because it was bad in terms of what its consequences for society are going to be. Conservatives who like the result don't care that it might be judicial activism. There's a gap between the rhetoric and the reality. You think it's just that liberals feel like, well, God, they've been hurling it. That, they've been hurling that phrase at us for so long. We could hurl it back at them now, but but we're we're just now we're just we're we're conditioned to just reject it. You think that's it? I think that's part of it. I think again, there's the sense that the phrase judicial activism has much more resonance with the right than the left, and the phrase judicial activism works much more for conservatives and Republicans than it does for liberals and Democrats. In our remaining time, I would like to ask. Um, a couple of more personal questions. Um, I have heard you say in private conversation that you've always been an activist at heart. How did you get that way? I mean, how, how do you, I mean, I'm asking you to psychoanalyze yourself, which is always a dangerous thing, but how did, how do you think you got that way? 
And given that you were or are an activist at heart, why didn't you decide to go into professional activism, being a political operative, et cetera, instead of becoming a law professor? The second is much easier for me to answer than the first. Um, I love teaching more than anything else I've ever done in my professional life. And I learned fairly early on that it was the thing that I enjoyed most. I thought all through college I was going to be a high school teacher and he actually took the classes and became a certified social studies teacher for high schools in Illinois. Did you ever teach in high school? I did my student teaching. And you I did taught high teaching. school programs okay. for many, many summers. Um, and, and so I, but I, I realized early on that, I mean, I loved teaching and when the opportunity presented itself, and I really fell into being a law professor, I could go home and say, this is what I want to do forever. On the other hand, unlike most law professors of our generation, I've also always been an activist, too. Um, I've handled a lot of the public cases we've talked about. Yeah. I ran for election in Los Angeles and was the chair of an elected commission to write the city charter. I was very involved in police reform in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. So I'm not an academic who could be very content just being in an ivory tower. Mm -hmm. I think my sensibilities are far more as an activist than they are as an academic. And I think the reason I became an academic is the love of teaching. Is the love of teaching. Um, the former question is much harder because I don't have an answer to it. I think that some of it is when I grew up. Um, I'm 57 now, so that meant that um, I was in high school from 1967 to 1971. Mm -hmm. I was in high school on the University of Chicago campus. I was very involved in participating in anti-war protests. I was tremendously influenced by the civil rights movement. Were your parents um, politically active? No. Um, me and my parents we went to college. My dad worked in a home improvement store on the south side of Chicago. My mom always worked in the home. And I would say that they were liberal Democrats, mm -hmm. but not particularly politically engaged. Was that, so there wasn't a lot of uh, politics being talked at the dinner table no. at night? No. Yeah. So this was um, something. So you're you're saying you're you're a product of your uh, uh, you're a product of your times. But I don't want to, in any way, lessen the impact of my parents. Um, my parents were incredibly decent people, and though they weren't political in the social sense, they were very political in the, in the decent sense of how they treated other people and the mm. lessons they imparted. And I mean, I think there's also they imparted in me and my siblings a very strong Jewish identity, and there's a huge part of um, Judaism of healing a broken world, what's called tikkun olam, the duty of every individual to make the world better. On my wall there, there's a, a framed poster that says, Justice, justice, thou shalt pursue, in both Hebrew and English. And I think that that too, if I were to mm -hmm. put together how did I come to be an activist, I think it's that. So I don't anyway want to lessen the role of my parents. Sure. Um, in the upbringing that they gave us. So maybe it was but a co it was that combination. Is that sure yeah. it is for all of us? A yeah. combination of our parents and the influences and the times at which we grew up. A uh, little less serious question. Uh, you're a huge baseball fan. Yes, are you? As am I. Um, I'm a Giants fan because I grew up in San Francisco. You're a Cubs fan because you grew up in Chicago. But you're also a Dodgers fan because you've lived, you lived a very large percentage of your adult life in LA. So the, here's the tough question, and you know what I'm gonna ask, which is if the Cubs and Dodgers met in the league championship series, who would you be rooting for? The Cubs, and it happened two years ago. And so that's an easy question, actually. Now, but my becoming a Dodgers fan actually goes back to Jewish identity. When I was a boy growing up, my favorite baseball player was Sandy Koufax. I think if you talk to any Jewish man of my age, they'd say that. So after the Cubs and the White Sox in the 19, early 1960s, my favorite team was the Dodgers. That's how I became a Lakers fan, because the Bulls didn't exist yet. But um, if it was Cubs against Dodgers, always root for the Cubs. Um, always root for the Cubs. Is that just because they're the hometown team, because you grew up with them? Or is it something more romantic? Is it, is there's just a romanticism about the Cubs. Are you, are, I mean, are you a romantic? I'll answer the easy question. I've been a Cubs fan my whole life. My father, though he grew up on the south side of Chicago, was a huge Cubs fan. Um, so my fondest memories of my father going to Cubs games with him. I think being a fan of a team in some way is like a religion. It's in, largely irrational, 
especially when it comes to the Cubs, it's a matter of faith. <laughs> and you just, it was imbued into me. And so... Uh, it, um, it's sort of unrequited faith. For the Cubs it is. Yeah. But, uh, and so I think that it comes from, that's what I, I have been my whole life. Um, so I shouldn't read into anything like that. It's just, you know, the underdog oh, and all that it, stuff. Because I mean, that, that sort of meshes sure. with your jurisprudence. You can't but that's be a liberal Democrat, Democrat yeah. this time and not be rooting for the underdog. Um, but I think that, that I think yeah. even if I were a conservative Republican, I would still be a Cubs <laughs> fan. So I can't attribute okay. any more than that. All right. So one final question, sure. um, and one that's more serious. Um, you obviously have taken on a very different role here at Irvine than any role you've ever had before. Um, you were at USC for a long time, you were at Duke for a while, and the only thing that could get you away from Duke was the opportunity to be the founding dean here. So obviously the, one of the questions is why now, why this, why be a law school dean. Again, it's a, you can make an argument that you're getting further and further away from sort of the activist um, role. Well, go ahead and answer that question. Sure. There is nothing I will have more of an effect on than hopefully my children than what I will have on this institution. I've been able to bring in spectacular administrators, wonderful faculty, recruit great students, and to help shape an institution. How many people get that opportunity in their lifetime? It's a wonderful set of challenges that have caused me to learn more than anything I've ever done. It's constantly forcing me to develop new skills, acquire new knowledge. And it's wonderful to be 31 years into my career as an academic and get you to do something that every day I get to do new things. And so I, I love the reason. Now, I'll be honest, if we simply replicate other law schools, mm -hmm. I think we will have failed. And I do have the goal that we can do a better job of preparing our students for the practice of law, that we do a better job of imbuing in our students a commitment to using their skills full-time and part-time for pay or pro bono, doing public service work. And I hope that one of the measures that can be used to evaluate this law school is, do we have more students who are going into public interest careers? Do we have more students who go to firms doing pro bono work? If the answer to that is yes, then I'll have succeeded, and if the answer to that is no, then we'll have failed. So you've answered my last question. Uh, the, the question I was going to ask is, if the UC Irvine Law School could turn out exactly the way you want it, you just described it. Well, my central goal is I want us to do a better job of preparing students to be lawyers at the highest level of the profession. I think each of us would say, we didn't graduate from law school very ready to practice law. I think law schools can do better. Now, I also would like to see our school be able to place our students in whatever kind of careers they want. Students who want to go to big firms, I want to help, small firms, public interest, government. But I really believe that every lawyer has a duty to do public service. Some may choose to do it full time in government or public interest places, but those who go to firms should be doing pro bono work. And I hope that our students will be doing much more in the way of public service than most law schools do with regard to their graduates. Erwin Shamarinsky, always a pleasure. My Thank pleasure. you for your time. Thank you.